In 1757, Siraj Odola, the ruler of Bengal, was defeated at the Battle of Plassey. In fact, the battle was lost before it had even begun. The commander-in-chief of Siraj Odola's army had already sold out to Robert Clive. The shadow of such treachery and betrayal haunts Bengal to this day. British traders were attracted to Bengal from the beginning of the 17th century onwards because Bengal's fine cotton muslins were highly prized in the markets of the West. By the middle of the 18th century, the British East India Company saw no alternative to military action to protect their trading interests. The defeat of Siraj Udullah in 1757 marked a turning point in Anglo-Indian relations. A century later, the British controlled most of the Indian subcontinent. The prolific Bengali textile industry was crushed. Bengal was turned into a marketplace for British-produced textiles and a source of raw materials for the Industrial Revolution in Britain. Besides cotton, there was jute. By the beginning of this century, East Bengal was producing most of the world's jute. Sacks and ropes made from jute were used all over the world. Under British rule, jute processing factories were set up, but only in West Bengal, especially around Calcutta. East Bengal, with hardly any industry, remained an agricultural backwater. By the time the British left, East Bengal, or for that matter Bengal, had become an importing country rather than an exporting country. And agriculture was poor. And East Bengal itself uh, was uh, cut off from Calcutta. Calcutta was the headquarters. And so, and the landlords used to live in Calcutta. So East Bengal was the hinterland. And in this hinterland, the majority of the population were Muslims, whereas West Bengal was predominantly Hindu. Most of the landlords throughout Bengal were Hindus and owned nearly three quarters of the land in East Bengal. There was hardly a Muslim middle class at all. 
As the independence movement gathered momentum, there arose a demand for a separate homeland for Muslims. This movement was led mainly by non-Bengali Muslims, but found great support in East Bengal, a crucial factor in the creation of Pakistan, which in 1947 united East Bengal into one country with the Muslim majority areas of Western India 1,000 miles away. The overwhelming majority of the Muslims here were Muslim peasantry, and they saw the establishment of Pakistan as economic emancipation for themselves, the establishment of democracy which would enable them as the majority to achieve political and economic justice, freedom from the exploitation of landlord, landlordism. When Pakistan was created, most of the Hindu landlords in East Pakistan fled to Calcutta. The land passed into the hands of Bengali Muslims, but real power eluded their grasp. Some economic and industrial development followed, as jute mills were finally built in the world's foremost jute-producing region. But the owners were all non-Bengali. This meant that precious foreign exchange earned through the sale of jute was invested in West Pakistan, where central government was based, rather than in East Pakistan. In fact, East Pakistanis soon came to realize that they were being ruled by a West Pakistani bureaucracy and army. And this manifested itself in a very gross way in denying Bengali the status of a state language. Pakistan, Bengalis were 56% of the population of Pakistan, and yet the central leadership and the central government sought to impose Urdu as the only state language of, of Pakistan. Mr. Jinnah, Urdu ke Pakistan ne rastavasha kore, ita ke chapi dawa jere chesta kore chilen. Tar mool udesho chilo. Je Bengali jodi alada jati shottha niye, ekta alada rastre rupantori to hoy. Taole ei region ne, shudhu Pakistan er modde noy. Bengali shobai ke dominate korbe. Ote jate kore ei jati shottha ar vikas na korte pare. Shei udesho ta chilo, phasa rupor akramon kore Bengali ke chapi dawa ya bondomiya dawa. And they manipulated the economic system such that the resources got transferred from East Pakistan to West Pakistan through trade, international trade, and also the resources received through aid uh, were mostly invested in West Pakistan. This led to a estimated transfer of about 70% of total public expenditures on revenue and development account being located within West Pakistan, found concrete expression in growing disparities in per capita incomes with visible evidence in the imbalances and availabilities of public services such as health, electricity, road transport. By the end of the 60s, the, most of the industries were in the hands of West Pakistanis. And not only industries, banks, insurance companies, the whole financial system was in the hands of the West Pakistanis, facilitated and promoted by the bureaucracy and the military regime that was uh, ruling the country at that time. So you had military rule which effectively continued from 58 to 69. And it was really those 10 years that the systematic denial of the rights of the Bengalis fueled Bengali nationalism. Because what was an assault on the language in 52 progressively became a denial of the legitimate rights of the Bengalis to participation in national government. If there was a parliament, they would have had majority of Bengalis would be there. Asole, 
পূর্ব পাকিস্তান ছাত্রলিক যেটা ছিলেন সে ছাত্রলিক বুঝতে পারে যে তাদেরকে আর স্বাধীন রাষ্ট্র হিসাবে আত্মপ্রতিষ্ঠা ছাড়া পাকিস্তান রাষ্ট্রের মধ্যে তাদের পক্ষে বাঁচা সম্ভব নয় তাই বাষট্টি সালে ছাত্রলীগের মধ্যে গোপনে স্বাধীন বাংলা প্রতিষ্ঠার জন্য একটা নিউক্লিয়াস গড়ে ওঠে শেখ মুজিব রহমান had by 1964 become the leader of the East Pakistani party the Awami League one of its main functions was to express the dissatisfaction that East Pakistanis by now felt about their underrepresentation in the political and economic life of Pakistan and you know all of central government administration is in West Pakistan capital central administration military installations everything was Pakistan though East Pakistan a 56 percent population is still they are not getting uh, any right in the central administration economic field in other fields naturally East Pakistan people want that they should get this self-determination and this full regional autonomy only for defense foreign affairs and currency should be in the hands of central government or the refugee power should go to the regions now when the leaders from Pakistan got together, Sheikh Mujib made the point, and that is the origins of the six-point demand, that yes, we want democracy, but we also want regional autonomy. We want democracy, but we want it within a federal framework where there will be a substantial measure of regional autonomy, and six points was really the detailing out of a new federal scheme. Mujib's political campaigns landed him in prison on numerous occasions. এই ছয় দেবা মূলত ছিল স্বায়ত্তশাসনের দাবি অটোনমি যাকে বলে ছাত্র যুব সমাজ এবং নিউক্লিয়াসের পক্ষে দাবি ছিল স্লোগান ছিল যে ছয় দফা না হয় এক দফা যদি স্বায়ত্তশাসন না হয় তাহলে স্বাধীনতা ডিসস্যাটিসফ্যাকশন উইথ দ্য মিলিটারি রেজিম ওয়াজ নট কনফাইন টু ইস্ট পাকিস্তান By 1969, as Field Marshal Ayub Khan was celebrating his so-called decade of development, there were massive public protests. The scale of the uprising in both East and Western wings was such that he had little alternative but to stand down. Ayub would not hand over power to the people. He handed over power to the head of the military, Yahya Khan. Yahya Khan, therefore, who was the real source of the strength of that particular power structure now had to come out into the open but having had to take power in the face of a strong and roused populace he had to concede to important popular demands one of those was for a national election and for the Bengalis very important point that had been injected was one man one vote when Yahya Khan took over in 1969 he inherited a very complex situation. It was a long political legacy in which many mistakes had been made. And from that angle, one can say Yahya Khan was as much a victim of history as he was a maker of it. When he took this particular decision of granting one man, one vote, this was to accommodate East Pakistan's wishes, particularly Awami Leagues. In 1970, November 12th, there was a terrible cyclone accompanied by tidal waves in which uh, we lost about more than a million people. And we found that uh, there was no response from Pakistan. I mean, Western Wing, no assistance came from them. And we were very bitter and dejected about the whole thing. And I became more furious as an individual. And my troops in EPR at that time, they were also very furious. We realized that the Pakistanis really hate us from the core of their heart. And that realization took a definite shape now. We said we can't live with them any longer. So this election was conceded. One man, one vote for, Beng for, for, for all of Pakistan was conceded, but it was to have particular significance for Bengalis because their majority, which had been negated, nullified, contained, would now first have an opportunity to assert itself for the first time in 24 years. The whole election then became a referendum on six points, and we took it to the people in those terms, that this is a referendum on the f future of shape of Pakistan. So far we have been ruled from Islamabad, from Karachi. Now we want the substance of power to be in Dhaka. 
In East Pakistan, Awami League won 167 seats out of 169, whereas in the West, People's Party won 87 seats out of 138. No other party was in even double figures. Now, as a result, this election brought two important candidates in the field, Mujib in the East and Bhutto in the West. Nirbhatanul Poro, Awami League Pakistan ke Awam Sheikh Mujib. একটা রাষ্ট্র পাকিস্তানকে রাখার জন্য ইয়াহিয়ার সাথে এবং ভুট্টোর সাথে নেগোসিয়েশন করার চেষ্টা করে কিন্তু ছাত্র সমাজ এবং সমস্ত বাঙালিরা যুব সমাজ এবং স্বাধীন বাংলা নিউক্লিয়াস এর বিরুদ্ধে যাতে করে কোনো কিছুতেই ভুট্টোর সাথে ইয়াহিয়ার সাথে শেখ মুজিবের এক রাষ্ট্র পাকিস্তান রাখার জন্য এই পরিকল্পনা কার্যকরী না হয় তার বিরুদ্ধে সমস্ত কাজ করে যেতে থাকে পাকিস্তান মিলিটারি জেন্টা was conspiring and finding excuses how not to hand over power. So Bhutto started issuing threats and making statements that uh, there cannot be a government formed without his consent, although he was not the majority. If a constitution on the basis of his six points would have been made, it would have been almost impossible to, to function as a one single unit, as each federating unit had the power to raise its own army, had the power to conduct foreign economic relations of its own, and the center was also not given the power to levy taxes. Now, with such a loose arrangement, it's almost impossible for any country to function. And I do not think any country in the world does function under these arrangements. Uh, Mr. Bhutto, making a statement soon after the election that majority is not everything. Should not be forgotten that the bastions of power lie in the Western wing. This created a very negative reaction and there was a strong re reply from here saying that we believe in democracy and in democracy people's power is the only significant power when expressed through elections. Yaya's intention had been that after the elections there should be a period between the the elections and the meeting of the National Assembly. And that period should be utilized by the political leaders to arrive at a consensus on the broad outline of the Constitution so that it could be framed within the stipulated period of 120 days. With that object in mind, he urged political leaders to have a dialogue amongst themselves. And in that process, Bhutto also went to, to Dhaka, had a three-day meeting with uh, Mujib, but that was a people said that we have agreed on five and a half points and only half a point is, is still left. So an ultimatum was issued. You must call the assembly or else. An assembly session was called for the 3rd of March. We got ready with our preparations for the assembly. We were going to table a constitution based on six points. Suddenly there was an announcement from Radio Pakistan that the National Assembly session, which was to be held on 3rd, had been postponed. Now this infuriated the whole country. If People's Party, which had 87 members from West Pakistan, had not gone to the National Assembly, other parties too from the West would have followed suit, at least some. That would have almost turned National Assembly into an East Pakistan Assembly. And that was a situation the Constitution could have been made but it would have been without a quorum. It would not have had the legal sanctity which a constitution needs to have behind it. And on that basis, Yahya thought it wise to postpone the National Assembly session. But where he did make a serious error in judgment was that he did not give a fresh date at the time he announced the National Assembly session. Within minutes of the announcement, people had started to pour out into the streets. In the stadium, there was a cricket match going on with, I think, MCC. The entire test match spectators poured out of the stadium onto the streets, saying this is unacceptable, and this was seen, as I said, an attempt to negate the electoral verdict. Immediately, they announced mass meeting in uh, university campus. Thousands of uh, general public participated, and the flag was hoisted by Mr. A.S.M. Abdul Rab. By evening in the 2nd March, uh, uh, virtually the whole uh, Bangladesh people were flying Bangladeshi flag 
in every houses. Then the student leaders met with the Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Uh, there was a strong pressure from the leaders not to succumb to the Pakistani pressure and declare independence officially. I want that uh, I want to live like a free citizen of a free country. You mean independence? That I don't mean. Yeah. It can be done many ways. Go, 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 go! Sheikh Mujibur Rahman issued a statement that uh, there will be demonstrations throughout the country till 6th, which will be followed by a mass rally in Sora Dutan. At that time, it was known as the race course on March 7. Shatui Mars. Pothon kintu pata kete ami Sheikh Mujib ke Paltor Madan diye chila. Kintu she din chokar ami Sheikh Mujib ke ei shadin malar pata kete ta ke dei. Tokon she jibba kewesh thori. Tini amake bolen eita onik beshi advance. This is too early. Ami bolle silam jeita early noy. This is the correct time. Eita shorty shoma. Military movements were continuing. We had reports that military movements were continuing from the west to east. Arm supplies, we heard, were also being stepped up. So that, the, uh, and on the other hand, the popular movement was also at its peak. The non-cooperation movement continued with full vigor. From 3rd March onwards, Awami League established almost a parallel government in East Pakistan. And it indeed was a very effective uh, parallel government. The taxes were stopped to the federal government. The, the offices were closed. The banks were functioning on their orders and on their instructions. And the program included demonstrations, strike in all government offices, schools, colleges, everything. And it started in Chirong as well. We had a call from Yahya Khan's military secretary saying, you Bengalis are known to be very hospitable people, but Yahya Khan has been here for three days and all he has been living on is biscuits because the Bengali cooks will not cook. The Bengali cooks have said they are non-cooperating with us. So will you please issue an exemption, allowing them to give him a cooked meal? So I discussed this with our leaders and said, yes, all right, we can allow him to have hot meals. The Bengali cooks were then asked in the president's house to resume their function. We maintained regular contact with the Ahmadi. And meanwhile, I started uh, mobilizing my forces. I really give them a hint of a mutiny for our own independence. Serving officers had begun to come and make contact, saying, you know, we are watching the situation and, you know, how is the city of Chittagong and the whole area keep it free for about two weeks, by which time they should be able to obtain support from foreign countries if needed. So the confrontations on, on the streets was mounting. The military on the one side against the, the roused people on the other. In Dhaka, as I say, supplies were being stopped into the cantonments. In Rangpur, there had been actual face-to-face -face confrontations between military and people. In Chittagong, where arms had, were being brought in on a ship called Swat. And at that time, you know, the political explosion had already taken place. There was movement throughout the country. And the people did not want that ship to be unloaded. Because we realized that arms and ammunition from that ship will be used against our own people. When they tried to unload it, 100,000 port workers just blocked two miles of the road from the ship into the city. And there were hundreds of thousands of people blocking the streets. Military were taking positions. And it was a question whether the military would really take on 100,000 people. The Pakistanis killed a large number of Bengali dock levers and demonstrators in the port areas. And uh, I realized that this is the time to strike. On 24th night, March 24, I passed on the orders. There are two code messages on which the EPR soldiers had to act, uh, mostly the soldiers who were in the border outpost. The messages were sent and they had acted upon, in which they had neutralized all hostile forces, mainly the non-Bengali troops in EPR. And by that action, myself and my troops who had acted on it 
had sealed our own fate and our destiny for the future. So either we act to the next 24 hours for a decisive battle, or we are arrested by the Pakistanis and court-martialed and probably shot. There is just no other way. আমরা শেখ মুজিবের সাথে রাত একটায় দেখা করি তার বাসায় এবং তাকে পরিষ্কার বলে আসি যে আপনি পাকিস্তানের রাষ্ট্রপ্রধান বা প্রধানমন্ত্রী হন এটা আমরা চাই না এবং আপনি চাইলেও কোনো রকম এটা হবে না আপনার মৃত লাশের উপরেই আপনার আওয়ামী লীগের লোকেরা বিশ্বাসঘাতকতা করে পাকিস্তানিদের সাথে আদাত করবে অতএব আপনাকে স্বাধীন বাংলার রাষ্ট্রপ্রধান বা প্রধানমন্ত্রী হতে হবে আপনি ইয়াহিয়ার সাথে যাই পূর্বে আলাপ করে থাকুন তার সাথে দেখা করে বলুন যে যুব সমাজ ছাত্র সমাজ বাঙালিরা এটা মানবে না অতএব আমার পক্ষে এটা করা সম্ভব নয় তাই চব্বিশে মার্চ অনির্ধারিতভাবে মুজিব ইয়াহিয়ার সাথে দেখা করে এবং তিনি যখন গণভবনে যান দেখা করতে তখন আমি তার গাড়িতে স্বাধীন বাংলার পতাকাটা জোর করে লাগিয়ে দেই যদিও ওনার ইচ্ছার বিরুদ্ধে এবং সেদিন তিনি সর্বশেষ বলে আসেন যে পশ্চিম পাকিস্তান থেকে বাঙালি যে সেনাবাহিনী আছে তাদের বাংলাদেশে পাঠিয়ে দিতে হবে দুইটা কারেন্সি করতে হবে আলাদা স্টেট ব্যাংক করতে হবে এমন কিছু দাবি উনি উত্থাপন করেন যেগুলি করলে আসলে পাকিস্তান এক পাকিস্তান থাকে না at that time the situation in east pakistan was that it was completely being run by awami league yajak was staying so to say de facto guest of bangladesh government you cannot let a country run like that he was tolerating it so that there is an understanding which will be reached between him and mujib and the the events will take their normal course the peace will return to it once agreement was not there there was no option he had to restore authority of the government nixon and kissinger had a great deal of sympathy for yaya khan because he was the first pakistani leader to hold uh, free elections and therefore they felt that sheikh, sheikh mujib should meet him at least halfway moreover i don't think that they expected him to resort to a campaign of terror in east pakistan i think they expected that he would take sharp quick military action and that would be sufficient as in had been in the past to put down riots in East Pakistan. The first target was the Dhaka University students hostels because again students had been in the militant vanguard. Students fortunately most of them by then had scattered. Teachers unfortunately you know had not been so quick to move. They started to go into teachers houses pulling out teachers lining them up and shooting them down. I in no way want to, to justify 
the, the military action, the way it was undertaken. But I just want to highlight the psychological atmosphere, the psychological environment in which that action was planned. You know, there was a very strong contingent of East Pakistan rifles, police, and armed students. And they were in fairly substantial numbers and well armed. Compared to that, army units, they were not as big as they are made out to be. And they were operating from one basic assumption that in case they fail, they will all be killed to a man. And then the tanks sought vengeance on the people because all these densely populated localities where poor people live, they use fire throwers. They just put them to the torch. You know, we saw the whole sky was red, a flame. And you could hear this heavy shelling and mortar and, and, you know, the whole city seemed to be as if, you know, there was a declaration of war. As a result of this systematic campaign of terror, millions of East Pakistanis took refuge in India. Sheikh Mujib was arrested and flown to jail in West Pakistan. Those Awami leaguers who had managed to escape the initial onslaught fled across the border into India. In April 1971, under the leadership of Prime Minister Tajuddin, they established a government in exile with Indian help. The Soviet Union gave limited support to the Bangladeshi cause. The US stood by their old ally, Pakistan. The United States did not feel that it could do much to stop Yahya Khan from trying to suppress the uprising in East Pakistan because its aid program was small and Yahya was trying to prevent the dissolution of his country, something no leader willingly presides over. Once the army went into action, Yahya and his associates were really trapped. They had committed themselves to this course of action and only superior military force would be likely to have prevented them from continuing it. One of the first and most pressing tasks of the government in exile was to organize the Bengali remnants of the Pakistani army. Major Rafiqul Islam and many like him led a guerrilla war during the long summer months of 1971. The government in exile was heavily dependent on the Indian government and applied pressure to them to invade in their support, to bring the war to a swift conclusion. In this, they were opposed by the radical student leaders who had also established a parallel guerrilla army with Indian government support. They wanted a war of national liberation to establish a socialist Bangladesh. The response of the Pakistani military regime was to pursue a vigorous campaign of terror, murder and rape. It is estimated that nearly three million people lost their lives. News of these atrocities reached the outside world and sparked off massive public protest and international condemnation of the Pakistani regime, which, however, continued to receive public support from the U.S. government. I think when we speak about the position of the U.S. government, we have to recognize what we're really speaking about is the policy of Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger because they were controlling U.S. policy at the time. There was a lot of criticism of the policy in the United States press, in the United States Congress, and even within the executive department. One reason for Kissinger and Nixon policy on this issue became known in the middle of July when it was announced that Pakistan had facilitated Kissinger's secret trip to China knowledgeable observers probably recognized that Pakistan had done more than provide an airplane and a takeoff point, that they had probed Chinese intentions, conveyed messages back and forth. And so Nixon and Kissinger felt some obligation to Yahya Khan uh, for his role in uh, helping the American rapprochement toward China come into being. There were by now an estimated 10 million refugees on Indian soil. Pressure was mounting for the Indian government to do something. Mrs. Gandhi later stated that the Indo-Soviet Treaty that was signed in the summer of 1971 had been under negotiation for over a year, although its final form may have reflected Indian perceptions that a U.S.-Chinese 
Pakistani axis was taking place. It may have also been due to Mrs. Gandhi's belief that even with in Indian assistance, the uh, guerrillas in East Pakistan would not be able to win out over the army and that therefore India had to prepare for military action because it could not hope to absorb the millions of Hindu refugees that were being driven out of East Pakistan. On the 3rd of December 1971, the Indian army invaded East Pakistan. It rapidly became obvious that the Pakistani army would be defeated. On the 15th of December, in a final cynical gesture, a Pakistani army death squad rounded up a number of prominent Dhaka intellectuals and summarily executed them. Well, the surrender of the Pakistan forces on the 16th of December was a great victory of the people against military power. And the thing that for 24 years had been the dominant motif, you might say, of national life in Pakistan, the military against the people. This was a decisive victory, or we had thought was a decisive victory, of people's power against the military. On the 8th of January, 1972, Majib was released from his Pakistani prison. He arrived in Dhaka via London on the 10th. During his period of confinement, Mujib had been denied any access to news or information of the outside world. Mujib was ignorant of the war and its effects on the people and the country. All the various political parties, paramilitary groupings and student leaders who had contributed and participated in the civil war proposed that Mujib form a government of national unity. Therefore, when Mujib opted for an Awami League government with himself as head of state, this immediately led to the formation of an angry and vocal opposition led by former student leaders. Mujib Rahman, who was a friend of mine, a great friend, Of course, he had little education, and none of us had the, had the experience of conducting the affairs of an independent state. You must remember this point. None of us had the experience of conducting the affairs of an independent state, because for the first time we became independent, with all these problems. The Bangladesh that Sheikh Mujib inherited faced immense problems. Nine months of war had brought not only death and destruction, but also the displacement of a very large section of the population. The biggest problem was rural poverty. Nine months of war had produced near anarchy in the countryside. Landlords organized private armies to consolidate and protect their property. Millions of displaced and landless people were looking for somewhere, anywhere, to grow enough food to survive. Sorry, <laughs> Physical force was not the only means used to steal from the poor. With the War of Liberation, war came back with full love enthusiasm to this country after finishing my degree and uh, participating in the War of Liberation preparations and publicity in the United States. So we thought we'll build the whole country anew. It's a great country that we were to build ourselves. So I joined Chittagong University and the years passed by. We saw how the situation slipped through the control uh, of the administration. 
who just walked out of the campus and started talking to people, particularly poor people. And there I came across a woman who worked for the whole day making bamboo stool. And for that uh, work, she earned only 50 paisa, one half of a taka. I couldn't believe that one can work for the whole day and earn such a small money. The reason she was making 50 paisa was she didn't have enough money to buy the bamboo and the cane she needed to make the bamboo stool. So the trader advanced her this little money and the trader paid the price what he wanted. So I wanted to find out how many other people did that. So I came up with a list of 42 such people in the whole village. And the total amount they needed, all 42 of them, was hardly $30. So I was ashamed of myself being part of a society which could not provide $30 to 42 able-bodied, skillful people. After liberation, my father wanted to fulfill his dream. And that was the main thing for the economic emancipation of the poor people of Bangladesh. And we had our four principles, that is nationalism, democracy, socialism, and secularism. And it was his commitment to the people, and he wanted to fulfill that. The basic questions of the ownership of land, of other assets, and also of decentralization of political control were not taken into consideration. And therefore, I would say, even after two, three years, uh, from, from that day on, the difficulties with establishment of socialism in this country started. In fact, we seem to be having a society which was headed by a criminal organization. You know, it, uh, briefly, I'd say, like, uh, for, say, for example, if um, mafia was uh, running America. He has allowed everyone to become corrupt. And he did not take any action against anybody, any of his party members, who has done such a crime which is inhuman and intolerable by anybody. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman uh, could not deal with the political movement in a democratic way. He felt jittery about the whole situation. Uh, he was virtually controlling the public, but uh, he could not face the criticism, accept the opposition. <laughs> Tarato regular force Birute Arakta regular force, parallel army. Jatakore, a army ketuni, mercenary army shave Babarkore, a Rocky Maniki Die, Uniunar, Rasto Komota Tiki Raka, Dolashashan Koim Gora Chestakole. He decided to crush the movement by state apparatus and physical force. So Rocky Bani was launched, the Amamali cadres were uh, armed and the opposition political movement were uh, harassed, offices burned down, arrested, killed. But it is one thing to hear, another thing to be ordered personally, you know, that you have to eliminate. Uh, if you left Pakistan army because of that, because you're not prepared to obey such orders, I don't see why I should obey orders of um, any Bangladeshi. It doesn't make any difference whether he's a Bangladeshi or a Pakistani or anybody. Tells me to eliminate a citizen. There is supposed to be a rule of law, a rule of justice. 74 had been a particularly difficult year. That was the year we had a terrible famine, and one which again was very unscrupulously exploited from outside as part of Kissinger's food diplomacy, where the food shipments which were due in August, September, to ward off the famine which we saw coming. We saw it coming because in July, there were very sudden floods which had destroyed over a million tons of, of food. There was a scare that the crop would fail in that year. And the newspapers reported that. And the traders and others who had food grain, they didn't release it, they hoarded it. And an artificial situation because of that scare was created. Another factor contributed, and that was the US aid food supply that was coming to Bangladesh in response to Bangladesh not accepting their demand about not selling uh, jute sacks to Cuba. They diverted that sheep and prices became so high in 1974 when the government came out saying that there was no shortage of food that was not believed by the traders 
and others who had food grain. And they kept on hoarding the food that they had, and we had this famine. This was artificially created in a way. Durbikhe, Abra Degben, Lokolokolok Marajam, Anangladesh and Ake. Shamogra Bishotek, Bangladesh, bottomless basket is away, Akaito. And the army, a conventional army, which are headed by the freedom fighting military officers, but they were trained and groomed in the Pakistani army. So this conventional army, uh, who in the Ayub regime uh, dominated Pakistan politics. So they felt an urge to dominate the Bangladesh politics also. And from then on, uh, the army also conspired uh, to overthrow Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and take the power of state, state power. And Mujib Khomotai ticket hakar jonno. Hazar hazar raaz no di kormi ke hotta kore. Jashodhe doshadar kormi ke jailer rakhe. Mosharo moshon ke hotta kore. Shirashidhar ke hotta kore. Ei dhoraneer raaz no di hotta mudhu diye. Phasi badi kaidae. Khobar kagos bondho kore diye. Kontho rod kore diye. Moli godi kya? Freedom. Manushe civil right. Aun manushe fundamental rights. Uli kathil kore diye Mujib Khomotai thakar chesta kore. So, in 1974, the situation was very volatile. Uh, there was massive strikes, uh, the economy crumbled, uh, the bureaucracy failed. Uh, so, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, to save the situation, went officially for emergency. Mujib Shahab went for Bakshal, which means one leader, one party, one country. Total disregard and betrayal of people's confidence, hope and expectation, and total negation of the constitution which we ourselves framed. That is Bakshal. Stopping newspapers, all newspapers excepting three, four under the government control. According to my reading, though cruel, it will sound. Mujib's political death was on that day on which he formed this one party, Bakshar. By 1975, Mujib had become increasingly in, unpopular in Bangladesh itself. And it seemed to be less a question as to whether or not he would be overthrown than who would overthrow him. Since most of the reports indicated that a group most likely to come out on top was basically a conservative right-wing group rather than a Marxist pro-Soviet group, the United States had relatively little concern about uh, the developments there at the time. The first obvious choice was General Zia because at least he was not tarnished. So after a lot of arrangements, I managed to see him on 20th of March, 1975, in the evening. General Zia said, I am a senior officer, I cannot be involved in such things. If you junior officers want to do it, go ahead. <clears throat> My father was so popular. And people had their faith on my father. So for three and a half years, they try to work against him. They try to take the people against him. They couldn't succeed. And at last, they conspired with some of the party member. So those people, especially Khandukar Mustaq and his group, they betrayed my father. I thought for almost more than a year trying to figure out alternate ways of how to do it without killing at all. But to the last, I couldn't figure out any way because A, the problem was uh, there were so many, so few people and so the people were so frightened and uh, the chances of any failure was so horrifying that I had no alternative left except to go for the ultimate level. 
I remember when these people came to shoot him, he was coming down the stairs and he said, if you think the people of this country will be happy by killing me, go ahead. And the first person, in fact, couldn't shoot. I mean, you know, he, 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 he literally did what Sheikh Mujib had expected, his hands trembled. So there was a contingency group outside who just ran in and shot him down. Sheikh Mujib rose to power as a champion of East Bengali nationalism. Even while in jail in West Pakistan, a thousand miles away, during the Liberation War, he remained an inspiration to tens of millions of his countrymen. When he returned in 1972 from jail in Pakistan, he had the whole population behind him. Three years later, when he and most of his family were gunned down in cold blood, there was hardly a murmur of protest. In August 1975, Sheikh Mujib Rahman was gunned down by a group of disgruntled army officers. But the roots of treachery and betrayal had spread far and wide. In 15th August, actually a few handful of army officers killed Sheikh Mujib Rahman, uh, but they did not take over. The important thing in the killing of Sheikh Mujib Rahman was that he was brutally killed but the takeover was done by another important Amalek leader, Mr. Khandakar Mustak Ahmed, who was a minister in the Amalek regime. Colonel Rashid, you and Colonel Farooq made Mr. Mushtaq president after Mujib's death. Did you bring him into the plot before that? Yes, uh, I had the first contact with him in, around the first week of August. And subsequently I met him on uh, 13th as well as on 14th. Around 1980, some journalists made charges that U.S. officials in Bangladesh had not only known that a coup was going to take place, but had actually been involved in it. Congressman Solars looked into these accusations when he contacted the State Department. State Department officials readily admitted that they knew that such a coup was in the planning stage, stated that they had informed Sheikh Mujib about this, uh, but denied that either the State Department or any other U.S. agency had been involved in plotting the coup. The issue was raised again by journalists in 1981 or early 1982. Uh, I took another look at the situation then. Uh, it was not possible to, for the House Foreign Affairs Committee to get access to CIA documents, and the House Intelligence Committee, uh, to whom Solars had written in 1980, had decided that th there was not enough evidence to warrant a full-scale investigation. Uh, so there was nothing more that we could do at a time when we were, of course, dealing with a great many other issues, all the way from Afghanistan to North Korea. I am a pro-American. 
I am a Democrat. Whomsoever is a Democrat is pro-American. Mushtaq imprisoned the prominent left-wingers of his own party in Dhaka Central Jail. On the 2nd of November 1975, less than three months later, this man, Colonel Khalid Musharraf, led another group of military officers in an attempt to seize power. On the night of the 2nd of November, four prominent members of the Awami League were killed in prison. It is alleged that the orders for their murder came from Khandahar Mushtaq himself. Khandahar Mushtaq came to the house and came to the house and came to the house. The house of Khandahar Mushtaq came to the house and came to the house. The house of Khandahar Mushtaq came to the house and came to the house. The house of Khandahar Mushtaq came to the house and came to the house and came to the house. ताते कोरे मोजीबेर शपक को है वा जनों को ने शपक को है यही भावे सामरी कुदेतार विरुद्ध थे आवार जो दी जनों को न मुस्तक के राष्ट्र कहूँ ता चुत करे ताहुले संभव बो तादुद्दीन एवं सुरेश नजरुल इस्लाम शो इरा आवार बांग्लादेश एक ता शॉर्कर गठन करते पारे अते मुस्तक चेह चिलें जे तार परवर्ती � Khandahar Mushtaq Ahmed stepped out of the firing line and Colonel Khalid Musharraf appeared to be in control until on the 7th of November he himself was gunned down by his own troops in what appeared to be a left-wing uprising from within the ranks of the army. Out of the chaos that followed, the same General Zia ur Rahman, who had stood aside while his junior officers murdered Mujib, exerted his power as the army commander-in-chief and became the effective ruler of Bangladesh. During the next five years, he faced more than 20 mutinies and uprisings from the ranks of his dissatisfied armed forces, which were put down with by now familiar brutality. Amnesty International and other reports claim nearly 1,000 of his own troops and officers were executed. On the 30th of May, 1981, General Zia was himself gunned down by fellow officers. The events surrounding the killing of General Zia Uraman remain confused. Many of the most senior officers involved were themselves killed shortly after they had surrendered to the authorities. What is clear is that after nine months of the caretaker government of Justice Abdur Sattar, the Army Chief of Staff, General Ershad, seized power in Bangladesh's first bloodless coup. Everybody heaved a sigh of relief that some protector has come to save the nation. And what I did, how I captured power, it is the military tactics. U.S. administrations were basically impressed with the job that President Ziar Rahman was doing to get the Bangladesh economy moving and provided considerable amounts of economic assistance to his government. They also urged him to try to move toward allowing some popular participation in government. Uh, they have, I believe, been somewhat less impressed with the government of President Ershad, but at the same time have supported it while continuing to urge him to allow some popular participation. General Ershad has been ruling Bangladesh since 1981, initially by declaring martial law and then through thinly disguised military regimes. In response to Western pressure, he has held a number of general elections. These have been boycotted by the opposition parties and dismissed as fraudulent by neutral observers. Colonel Farouk, self-confessed killer of Mujib, after a short period of exile, returned to stand as one of the election candidates. After 15 years of Bangladesh, now you find that there is virtually no civil right, no political right. There is no trademark right. There is no right of strike. There is no right of mobilization. Even the freedom of speech and freedom of press is very, very curtailed. 
This is one aspect. On the other side, on the economic side, we are gradually becoming poorer and poorer. Of course, few people are becoming richer and richer, but they are very few in number. The majority of the people are getting poorer, the living standard deteriorating day by day. So this is a very frustrating situation so far the economy is concerned. The British exploited rural East Bengal. The West Pakistanis exploited rural East Pakistan. Successive Bangladeshi governments have also failed to tackle the problems of rural Bangladesh. I think only Ethiopia is below Bangladesh uh, according to latest World Bank statistics in terms of per capita income. The per capita income is only US $130. That conceals the fact that the distribution is highly skewed and over 80% have income which is below the poverty level. The second piece of statistics I'd like to cite is, is the um, infant mortality rate, which is 120 per 1,000 live births. And in the developed countries, it is about 10. So that statistics itself is an indication of the level of poverty. The latest nutrition survey shows that over 80% of the people uh, have inadequate nutrition and about 50% very severely malnourished. So you see the green, all right, it is green. You see probably rice crop. But that conceals the fact that there is control of land about 10% of the rural households control over 50% of the land. About 30% of the people are totally landless. Another 30, 32% marginal farmers. And another 10, 12% maybe somehow pull through. If you add that all up, you will see from uh, landless to marginal to small farmer over 80% of the population. The various military governments have attempted to solve the problem of landlessness by settling landless Bengali people in the Chittagong Hill Tracks, the sparsely populated homeland of various non-Muslim tribes like the Chakmas. এবং আমার বিক্ষু থারার উপর অমানসিকভাবে মানে নির্যাতন করা হয়েছে এবং একগো বিক্ষু জগত কিনেতে তারা গুলি উড়ি মারে ফেলে জন্দই আমার সমস্ত বুদ্ধ মন্দির যা আগে সমস্ত কিছুই তারা জালে গুড়ি করে সাইকেল দিত তো যেহেতু তারা সন্দেহ ধর্মগান তারা নসান তারা মানে আমার এই যে এখানে পরিস্থান ও আমার এই সমস্ত অর্গানাইজেশন কিছু তারা ইয়ান নসান তারা সন্দেহ আমার জাতরে এই পৃথিবীর বুগত্ব নিশ্চিন্ত করে দিন অর্থাৎ বাংলাদেশ সত্ত্বেও নিশ্চিন্ত করে দিন তো তারা সলে বলে কৌশলে তারা আমার উপর এই সমস্ত যে আক্রমণ তারা গঠন এবং সেনাইতে মই যেখানে ইন্ডিয়া বর্ডারের মধ্যে মই রিপুজি যাবে সেলতারে লোক अकॉर्डिंग टू द इंटरनेशनल वर्किंग ग्रुप ऑफ इंडिजिनस अपीयर्स परहैप्स 200000 ट्राइबल पीपल a third of the indigenous people of the Chittagong Hill Tracks have been killed by the military of Bangladesh or by settlers. 250,000 settlers, landless Bengalis, from the flames have taken over much of the agricultural land in the Hill Tracks, particularly in the north. Thousands of our peoples have been the driven from their house and lands. The solutions of the problem of the Bengali landless is not to take the lands of tribal people by force and to kill us. Already 50,000 tribal people are refugees in India. In the Hiltax area, there are a few 
tribal living who have distinct national characteristics, different language from Bengali, different cultural uh, attitude, other tastes, all these things. So they have a distinct national identity. So what they are wanting is that they should have certain amount of autonomy within the framework of Bangladesh, which is a 100% justified demand. But our government, since Majib's period and later on all the subsequent government, wanted to reply their demand by military operation. Now there is a serious kind of military operation is going on in the whole of Hiljakt area. There are so many cantonments in the whole of Hiljakt area. And unfortunately, what Pakistan army did to us in 1971, we are probably doing almost the same thing to them in the Hiljakt area now in 87. Recently, as a result of international pressure, the government of Bangladesh has announced a halt to its settlement program in the Chittagong Hill tracks. There are, however, still 25,000 tribal refugees in India who are afraid to return. Genocide in the Chittagong Hill tracks cannot solve the problem of the millions of landless people of Bangladesh. The rapid siltation of the rivers sometimes offers fertile delta land for cultivation. Desperate landless people will often risk their lives from cyclones and floods by settling on these unstable islands that emerge out of the sea. This whole area was uh, under the sea about 20 years ago. It uh, accreted uh, very fast. The land came up very quickly after that. About 15 years ago, it was all mud. And when the project first got involved here, it was mostly mud with a little bit of rough grazing, a very small amount of cultivated land. Normally, under these conditions, land is grabbed by large operators who invest in fabrication of documents, in employing uh, private armies who come onto this land and, and occupy it on behalf of the landlords. <laughs> However, for the in the face of government neglect, numerous voluntary bodies called non-government organizations have sprung up in Bangladesh since the War of Liberation. In 1987, they numbered many hundreds, each with its own particular solution to the fundamental problems of rural poverty, access to money and access to land. Even the Noakkali Land Reclamation Project, which had received some official and foreign backing, was given title to the land it reclaimed only in 1986, many years after the project had started. Land grabbers, too, have influence in politics. Now, the elements which have contributed to this scheme have been the Bangladesh Water Development Board, which constructed the polder, designed and built it with assistance from the Dutch government, technical assistance. It was financed by the Dutch government. A very important element was organization of the landless people, which was done by a local non-government organization called Nijirakuri. We have in this project about uh, 30 societies, a total of about 900 families, each family having two acre cultivable land and uh, some area for homestay, drainage, uh, general facilities, community center, etc. The, the salient feature is that the societies, they cultivate the land collectively and nobody owns a particular field, but everybody is a shareholder of the, all the lands of the society. <laughs> সম্পত্তি করি আমরা অভাবে তারপরে দি কারো স্বামী দাইছে কারো স্বামী মরি গেছে 
যাইয়ার হর আমরা অনগা আঙ্গরে হাসা কর জমিন দিছে দিছে আর আমরা শ্বাস করছি ও দান হানো আমরা ব্যাগ লইছি নিজেরা শুকাইছি নিজেরা ব্যাগিং লাইন করছি মরিচ কদুর করছি কাইন দান কদুর করছি হরি কদুর করছি তার আগে আইনটা তো আল্লাহ যেদিন দে আরে বেশা করোনা রাশা আছে Many millions of Bangladeshis will never have access to land without fundamental changes in government policy. In an effort to provide the rural poor access to credit at a reasonable rate of interest, Dr. Yunus found his own unique solution. Commercial banks refused to lend money to those without assets. And in 1983, we became a bank called Grameen Bank. 75% of this bank is owned by the borrowers, the poor, landless borrowers of this bank. And at this moment, we have nearly 300 branches. And we give loans only to landless people, men and women. Today, we give loans to 230,000 men and women, landless men and women. Very, very poor person. <laughs> এই আয় উন্নতি হইছে এখন বাটটা খাইতে পারি ছেলে দুই ছেলে জি কৃষি কাজ করে স্বামী অসুস্থ আগে তে গৃহস্থি কাজ করতে পারে না এখন কোন কাগজপত্র লেখা দিলে হে বইয়া লিখতে দেখতে পারে এই দিয়া সংসার চালাইছি আমি বারাবং বারাটারা বানি স্মলেস্ট अमाउंट दैट वी लेंट आउट सो फार इज अबाउट अ डॉलर 30 টাকা এন্ড দ্য ম্যাক্সিমাম अमाउंट दैट वी गिव टू वन इंडिविजुअल इज 5000 টাকা and the average amount of loan that goes out is about $60. The poor people are the ones who pay you back. But still, they are the people who never receive any loan from a commercial bank. This is not only true for Bangladesh, this is anywhere in the, in the whole world. Dr. Yunus's Grameen Bank benefits 230,000 people, which happens to be the number of Bangladeshis born each month. The Noakali Land Reclamation Project benefits 1,000 families. Many other such non-governmental organizations each devised their own way to help the poor. But the population of Bangladesh is about 100 million and growing at a staggering rate. It is estimated that it will reach 200 million in the early years of the next century. This in a country the size of England and Wales. The evidence would indicate that Bangladesh has the capability to cope with the rising population and to in fact feed even these astronomical numbers which appear on everyone's charts. An FAO study indicates that in the year 2000, if Bangladesh in fact exploits the various technological possibilities which exist with its agriculture and can provide the necessary supporting services, and it might be added, if you can carry out the social engineering which gives access to land and earning opportunities to the bulk of the population, it is reckoned that you could support as many as 12 people per hectare, which is one of the highest rates of support capacities of any uh, agrarian system in the world. In rural Bangladesh, the main resource is land, and therefore access to land has to be a very important element in the strategy for alleviation of poverty in this country. We have had committees established by the government uh, to recommend on land reforms, and we have those. But somehow the basic question of the ownership pattern of land has remained untouched. In Majib's period, there was no democracy. Jia's period, there was no democracy. Now it is. It is a mashallah government, military rule. It's a zanta that is ruling the country. It's not a civilian government. So these tragic things happened after 15 years of Bangladesh. The country belongs to the people and must be ruled by their genuinely elected representatives. And the military are to be subordinated to the elected representatives of the people. Because 24 years of the history of Pakistan had been people trying to contain the military. We had won at the cost of 3 million lives. Now. The whole army is polarizing on one side to retain their state, uh, hold on the state apparatus and the people are polarizing on the other side uh, to, for 
uh, achieving democracy and wipe out army and civil bureaucracy uh, totally. So this is the position we are facing now. We are heading for another clash. It is not a clash between General Irshad and the people. It is a clash between the army and the people. Sharbo pori bej grasi hole shamanno bhater khuda bhaya boho pori nuti niyashe niwantran kore. Drisho theke drosta abdi dhara bahi kota khe fele aboshe se jathak krame khabo gach pala nodi nala gram ganjo फुटपाथ नर्दमार जलर प्रपात चलाचल कारी पथचारी नितम्ब प्रधान नारी उद्दीन पता सह खाद्य मंत्री और मंत्री गाड़ी आर क्षुधार का कि फेलना नय आज भाद्य हराम जदा ता मानचित्र खाव Agdu are, Santaro the Agdu are, shop shop we chole oedar. 